Good morning, everybody. Tim Walsh coming to you live from the University of Illinois campus at the Fire Service Institute from the Dirty Classroom. Bobby Hoff and I are going to be talking about fire department chief officer responsibilities as it relates to the COVID-19 response. Hopefully you're online and you'll submit our questions uh, to us so that we can get you involved in the conversation. We're going to cover some areas uh, all through the week, the next two weeks, that are pertinent to the first responders all, all across the state of Illinois. Please bear with us. Uh, this is brand new for us, but we wanted to make sure that you guys had some place to go to talk to uh, people that were in the service or currently working in the service to get you the answers that we need together as a group. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby now. We'll be both jumping on and off of the camera so that we maintain social distancing. And uh, please go ahead and start sending us your questions. If there's some other direction that you want us to go, please let us know where you want us to go. Bobby? Morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, the mission of IFSI is to educate and train like we always do. This is important that we reach out. We're, by no means are we experts in this field. We have a lot of information to cover today, we'd like to cover. Um, we're here to spread that information so we can educate first responders uh, not only fire service, but police and healthcare workers. So we're here to cover some basics today on fire chief's responsibilities and the FD responsibilities as far as it goes to this event. Um, again, this is, uh, this is a loose forum here, so we're gonna just go over some, some uh, basic points. And what I'd like to start out is, is for the chiefs. And by no means, I understand that many departments are probably covering these things and going over the the SOGs that they have in place. This is for departments that aren't and to add information that you may need. So again, there's nobody more important than our first responders. In our little world that we live in, we're talking about the firefighters and paramedics. We need to get this information out. We need to reassure our members that are on the street every day dealing with this, that it's gonna be okay, that we're gonna back them up, we're gonna get equipment for them, and we're gonna be there for what they need. So how do we do that? We communicate with each other. We're going to talk a little bit later on about communicating outside our own world, outside the fire service. It's an all agency thing. It's an all agency hazard. We need to talk about that. We'll get to some of that later. What we'd like to cover now is, again, the chief officer's responsibilities. Many of you may be doing this. Some of you may not. If this is going to help you, please take notes and write it down. We don't have all the answers, but we've been through some events that we've learned from that we want to pass the information on. So here we go. You have to inform, reassure, train, educate, and equip your troops. We adapt and overcome in the fire service. We always have and we always will. So to start that as chief officers, where do we start? We start at the communications level. And we know we're dealing with 70% volunteer departments that may only have one chief. They may just have company officers, but it's got to start at the top and work its way down. And it's a two-way street. We've got to work from the top down and the bottom up. So to have that, we're going to talk a little bit about staff meetings, in-house staff meetings. Again, I may veer off from volunteers to career pay departments, but bear with us. Um, number one, and first and foremost, is to have meetings with your chief officers, your company officers, shift by shift. Why is it important we all get ha all hands on deck? Because we can think a lot better when we have more information. So again, what we wrote here today is for the meetings, the internal meetings. What's more important, our personnel are number one. If we don't take care of our personnel, put them in proper PPP, PPE, and educate them, we're gonna fail. We don't wanna fail when that door goes up and the bell rings. Who do we bring in these meetings? We bring in our chiefs, we bring in our union executive board. We bring in the EMS coordinator. Those people are the people that we're gonna work with to get some type of game plan if we don't already have one. Um, again, protection for our personnel. We have to educate them. This is an ever-changing event that we're living in right now. We don't want to blow it out of proportion. We want to make sure our people are educated so when the bell rings, they know what they're up against. In a positive manner, ensure your troops daily. Ensure them daily that our job is to be prepared, ready to respond. So what do we do with that? We have meetings on communications. We have meetings on equipment we're going to wear. We have protocol on calls that we go on. So again, there's departments out there that have written guideline sheets that they put out for their, their departments and their ambulances, their fire companies, and their chief officers when they respond to these types of events. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Again, from the top to the bottom, chief officers, and I don't mean this in a bad way, you have to listen to your membership. They're going out on these runs. 
They're encountering what we're not encountering all the time. How do we fix that? We listen to them. We make corrections on the fly. We also go out and take in these calls with them. We don't have to put ourselves in a situation where, and we know people have, where only one paramedic may go in, that's a written SOG. We'll talk about IDPH guidelines, CDC guidelines in a minute. We're not gonna get into the depth of it, but we'll talk about what's out there for you to resource. There's so much stuff available on the internet. It has to be done on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis, because this stuff changes. So again, questions. Uh, keep your members informed. Get that fear level down. Just because someone went on a call and someone had COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19, and if you followed all your procedures, that does not mean you were exposed. It does not mean you were exposed. No, you're good there, Bob. Okay. So, hey, some of the info that we're gonna put out to you right away is the CDC website is awesome for uh, responder guidelines and dispatcher guidelines. That's available to you guys. The International Association of Fire Chiefs website, the International Firefighters website, the AFFI website, the Associated Firefighters of Illinois, and then here in the state of Illinois, IDPH is putting out guidance as well. So we're not here, like Bobby said, making sure that we're the experts. We want to steer you to the experts and make sure that you have the proper information. We're going to talk about uh, response guidelines, requesting supplies and PPE, which I'm sure is on everybody's uh, plate right now, to make sure that we give you that information as well. Bobby? Again, let's get back to the internal part of this in the fire service and the firehouses, and that's roll call. That's something we do every day. As this, as this event progresses, what do we need to cover? We need to talk about the company officers that are exchanging information from shift to shift. What calls were given the day before? How did they respond? What did they encounter? We need to cover that stuff. It needs to be written down. Documentation, we'll talk about that in a little while. Hey guys, just so everybody knows, we will be answering any questions live as they're coming to us and there is a site that we'll post at the end of the end of the talk today where you can go in and watch it with your crew members later so we'll answer all questions as they come in daryl we got that question and we're getting to it go ahead bobby sorry no problem things to cover at roll call again we've got uh, we got outside agencies we'll talk about internal policies first which is your response quick reference guides Every department should have a quick reference guide so when they respond to some type of event, it doesn't have to be an EMS call, it could be a pin and accident. How do we know if someone's got COVID-19? We don't. So we need to discuss things like that. But going on the runs and route to the call, what do we wear if we have a suspected PPE or a suspected COVID-19 event? On the call, what do we do? Does one paramedic go in and the rest stay outside? That is part of your SOGs. It's written in the IDPH guidelines CDC's got information out there. You can draft, if you don't have something, you can draft it or call the department next to you and see what they're doing. En route to the hospital, are we taking family members? No, not unless it's a child. That stuff is written down, those are CDC protocols. At the hospital, what do we do at the hospital? The hospital, the first, first responders go to the hospital. We need to talk to the healthcare workers at the hospital. What's going on? Do they have enough equipment there? Where are we putting the patients? A lot of departments are just taking their patients in, dropping them and going, or filling out their reports back at quarters. Uh, that's stuff that we need to talk about. Again, going back to roll calls, what do we talk about? The SOGs, what are your SOGs? Do you have any? If you don't, you need to get some. Very basic and very generic. Precautions, PPE, which ones are, what are we wearing and what runs? Hygiene, which items do we use and when? Showering, changing clothes. Firehouse decon, washing clothes. Going home clean to protect our families. We need to discuss this. We need to answer our personnel's questions when these questions come up. Make sure good documentation of runs and events are completed. Company journals, EMS reports, BCs and chief officers. We have newer, younger paramedics, newer, younger company officers that may not have encountered events like this. We need to help them through that. Who, what, where, when, and why. Documentation is key. If something comes up down the road, we know we need to have it documented. We need to have it written down. If you didn't write it, it didn't happen. Quick reference guides, that I, I said before, quick reference guides in, in the apparatus. All three shifts have to be consistent for departments that are, that are career and paid, or, uh, paid eye call that have shifts. Even volunteers, you gotta have that reference guide in the vehicle. You never know who's gonna be jumping in that ambulance or that vehicle to go to the call. Everybody's gotta be on the same page. Very, very, very important. Chiefs, thinking ahead. What do we got left? What do we have left in our equipment stockpile? 
Do we think ahead? Do we call ahead? We have outside agencies we'll talk about. If we need to call Mavis for equipment, we will call Mavis. If we need to call suppliers, vendors, I hope it's already been done by most departments and most chiefs and most people do the purchasing. So let's, hey, Bobby, talk Bobby, let's talk about that for a minute. So Bobby's talking about the supply chain now a little bit. So the supply chain during a national emergency is a little bit different. So we need you to reach out to Mavis first, all right? The mutual aid box alarm system in the state of Illinois, mavisillinois.org, okay? And we'll get you that contact information at the end and we'll actually post it now, we'll have some going to post it. You also need to talk to your local EOC, Emergency Operations Center. You need to talk to the state job center through IEMA. And then any requests that we can't fulfill on a regional basis, those will go to the state. The state will request the feds for assistance and we'll try to get you the, the PPE and the information that you need, that you need. Also, external meetings. Bobby's gonna cover a little bit of that now. We talked about internal roll calls and taking care of our people in the firehouse, but we also need to, to collaborate with all the other agencies that are involved in this. This is a public health issue, right? The fire department is supporting public health every step of the way. That's the way we need to address this. Bobby? Just to get back to recap before we go on to other things, the roll calls within your department. Again, you wrote the word we here. We, we are a team, we all work together. Chief officers, company officers, the union, EMS coordinators, and the outside agencies we'll talk about in a minute. We have to talk about this. We can't bury it, it's gotta be fixed. I can talk, uh, we'll talk about Mavis in a little bit and some of the pre past experiences we've had, what we've learned from. Mavis was a wonderful, wonderful asset. We'll talk about that in a minute. So again, roll call, what to cover. We talked about that, covering the PPE, your response. Write down the incidents you've had. Just because you have gone to someone that's supposedly infected with the coronavirus doesn't mean that you've been exposed. If you've had the proper PPE on, you've deconned, that should be well enough to go. Um, external meetings. And again, uh, Dan Ellis is gonna cover some of this stuff later in the week, but I wanna cover this because it's extremely important. And what are the first two departments that are usually on the scene of an incident? FD and PD. And if we don't work with our brothers and sisters in blue, meaning the police department, we're gonna have issues. They need to know what we know. They need to have that reference guide sheet that we have in our vehicles. So how do you, how do you get to that point? The time chiefs, chief officers, shift commanders, Get out and go to a PD roll call. If you can't do it on Skype, you can't do it on a teleconference, go out and meet with them. Go out and talk to them. Tell them, here's what we're doing for this kind of event, this type of run. It helps. We don't want them to get infected just like we don't want to get infected. We need to educate each other. We need to be on the same page. So we need to reach out to our PD personnel first. Who's next? Our healthcare providers. We need to get in the hospitals. We need to talk to ER docs. We need to talk to those EMS regional coordinators. We need to sit down as chief officers and find out what we need to do to help them and how they can help us. It makes for a smooth transition when you bring a patient in. There's some stuff we're gonna talk about at the end here where uh, through IDPH from CDC about talk about getting refusals. So people have, may have signs and symptoms. They're not very, very ill, but they may have the flu-like symptoms. How they, how they can sign a refusal, refusal and not go to the hospital and not overwhelm our healthcare facilities. We'll talk about that. All of this stuff is on websites, which we'll go over before we're done here. So again, go back to external meetings. Village officials, we as fire department personnel, because we've seen things like this, may have to reach out, and I don't mean this in a bad way, we may have to shake our village officials to say, hey, this is the real deal, we need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We need to sit down and talk to them. If we need to be the lead agency, we need to be the lead agency. We have to get out there and get the ball rolling. It's not too late. Even though this event has been going on for a couple of weeks, we need to get out there and talk. Be prepared. Who do we involve in these meetings? Your Office of Emergency Management, if you so have one, if smaller departments or not. We might have to go to the village next door and work with them. Your PD, your hospitals. Get your EMS coordinators involved. Your ER docs, your ED docs, they know what's going on. We need to bring them into the fold. Very, very important. We don't want to overwhelm these hospitals. Local health department, emergency managers if you have them. Social services needs to be involved. Why? Because we have a lot of elderly out there. Where are we going to put these elderly? Do they live alone? Do they have family members that can take care of them? We have a lot of seniors facilities in our districts. We need to get out there and reach out to those managers of those facilities 
and find out if they have a contingency plan. Because we don't want to be at 2 o'clock in the morning, we don't want to be overwhelmed and find out that we have to move people out of that building and they can't be on lockdown. Those are some of the things you have to discuss. We have to look at the ugly side of this, be ready for it. Um, again, for some of you that, for some of you that don't know, for the, for the uh, again, the state, the government, we need to talk to the federal, or the federal government goes through the state. State is who we go to to get requests for help. We need to get that line of communication open. We need to talk to those people. We need to have an open ear with them. And I, I could just go back to while we're on this, I could go back to, and I'll use a, uh, Katrina for an example. When we went down to Louisiana, we were there 17 days, Illinois Mavis went down there. And if it wasn't for Jay Reardon and his staff, and now it's Glenn, Glenn Erickson's down there now, a wonderful group of people. If it wasn't for Illinois Mavis, we would not have gotten supplies that we needed desperately. Because they reached out, picked up the phone, and they called people. They made things happen. We can't wait for things to happen. As the fire service, we have to be ahead of the curve. We have to jump on this now. And Mavis is a great example of what happened during Katrina. We were safe, we were sound, because we had the equipment, because we were front-loaded, and they went to bat for us. And it was, it was an ugly situation with politics and stuff, but you know what? We're in a crisis right now. We need to fix stuff, and people are gonna get their feelings hurt, no matter who they are. Oh well, tough stuff. So what Bobby's saying to everybody is we need to get out of the process, the process of getting work done. We need to pick up the phone or have meetings face-to-face -face at a safe distance to complete tasks on a daily basis within your region, within your locality, within the state, and then working through state IEMA and the governor's office to request supplies and equipment that we need to protect the public. So no more emails. People are overwhelmed with emails right now. Go speak to the person that you need to see. Go get an answer. Get an answer for the people on the street. We're doing this for the people on the street that are responding to these calls every day. They need to feel supported. I feel right now that sometimes they don't, and there needs to be some advocacy at every level, and especially at the chief officer level. Bobby? Uh, we covered emergency managers, social services, get them involved. Uh, departments, your surrounding departments, your auto aid departments. For example, if you have a situation where you have a, a, someone that is exposed, vehicles need to be decoyed. You, your department might have one ambulance, you might have two ambulances, medic units. You need to call that department next door and give them a heads up. Hey, we're gonna be down, we got some downtime. Our ambulance is gonna be out of service. You might be picking up our calls. Again, when you go to the state level, and, and I know this through when we worked in the city of Chicago, you have private ambulance companies on retainer. They're there if we need them. You need to know all this. Again, that's why you sit with your unions and say, if we get to this crisis, if we get to this stage, and all of our recall people are back to work, and we have to think this way, and we've got so many people laid up, we've got so many people on rehire, and all of our medic units are, are uh, out on the street, we need to st think about reaching out to other people. It's about people's lives, it's not about us. So this is a time when we have to pick up the phones and talk to each other and have that game plan. In many places, and I know in the city of Chicago and outlying areas, in the metropolitan area, there are plans written. We need to take them out and look at them. We need to look at them before we need them. So we're vel first. So we don't want the, the uh, most of the responders in the state are volunteers, 70%, we realize that. So local fire chiefs, local sheriffs, local police chiefs, and usually county emergency managers, you guys and girls are gonna be the one that are leading this charge in the smaller communities. You need to meet together every day. You need to reach out to your local hospital coordinators and have a Skype meeting or a Zoom meeting so that you can get plans ahead of time. We need to anticipate what could possibly happen. And if we direct our plans to anticipate what we're gonna do, then we'll be ready when we have to uh, use those. If you have questions, I'm gonna reiterate again now, please send me those questions. Bobby and I are doing a lot of talking. We want this to be a two-way street. So you guys, if you have a specific question that you don't feel is being answered by your chief, by your department, by your locality, send it to us and we'll help you get the information that you need. Uh, just a thing on PPE, if you're running low on PPE and you've reached out to vendors and they're, they've got to call in to get their stockpile re replenished. Think about Mavis, think about your, your hazmat uh, uh, suppliers, talk to people, see if you can get that stuff. We've got stuff stockpiled in certain spots, this is the time to use it. Let's not wait for the next event, let's use it for the event that we have right now. On that note, PPE and N95 masks, 
Uh, talking this morning, talking to someone from the Illinois Department of Public Health, there's a protocol out there about cleaning them if you haven't been exposed, using them, cleaning them, and using them again. I know that's not, people don't want to hear that, but if they weren't uh, exposed, they weren't contaminated, we can use them again. It's on their website. Take a look at it. It's going to help us. We need to get the stuff to the hospitals and the first responders. So if we have stuff we can use and reuse, let's do it. We're not putting ourselves in harm's way. Read the guidelines and they'll tell you what you need to do. Another issue, we want to support the people in the restaurant business, right? It's it, it, very busy at the firehouses right now. You're not having time. You're not getting the food that you need. But if you're out shopping, if you're staying in the firehouse, let's support local restaurants. They'll work with you and make sure that your guys are fed. Let's have those plans ahead of time. If you're calling people back in off duty, or if you're bringing in staff to man your firehouse, if you're a volunteer agency to respond to these efforts. And then, as Bobby was talking about later, earlier, if you're gonna to have to quarantine your personnel, are there local hotels and motels in your area that you can set up an arrangement with now rather than sending those people home to their families, right? We need to be responsible for the people that we protect on the job every day, but their families are somebody else that we need to respect and take care of. Bobby, would you please hit on that too? Yes, uh, one thing I, I have on my notes here but I don't have on the board, and that's very, very critical part of our, our interagency working is our dispatch centers. I did not cover that and I would like to. The dispatch centers, they triage calls. Sometimes they don't get good information, sometimes they do. We need, as departments, we need to listen, number one, and most importantly for chief officers, battalion chief, shift commanders, company officers, listen to the call coming in. If you don't feel there's adequate information, it's not coming through on your MDC, get on the radio and ask so we can all hear what's going on. And we have to notify our PD when we're going to these types of runs. We have to work together. And I know in the, in the town that I worked in recently before I retired, we had an excellent working relationship with our police department. And you know what? We went to their roll calls. They came to ours. We interlocked, we intertwined, we worked together well on the street. It's about the, when the bell goes off and the door goes up. The people that are on the street, our people, are the most important. We need to make sure the bases are covered and we're all communicating. Um, with the dispatch system, with the working with the EMS system, the medical directors, there's policies out there, there's policies that are ever changing right now. We know that the IDPH and the CDC are very, very busy. They're trying to get stuff out to the first responders. That website is constantly changing. I mean, it changed a couple times this morning where they added more information. You need to look that stuff up. As chief officers, get that out to your people. Bullet point it and get it out there so they know what's going on. Why is that important? Again, we talk about sign refusals for people that are sick. They're not, they're not critical, they're not dying, they have flu-like symptoms. We're trying to tell them, stay home, shelter in place, because we need the beds in the hospitals for things if they get worse. We don't know what's going to happen, but we have to prepare for that. Um, again, going back to what's gonna happen, we don't know. We've been told that it's 10 days for this data to be put together and put out so, correctly. It's 15 days, hopefully, to see a reduction. Hopefully, we say. We may not. And I just got a great question offline on my cell phone. You guys can text in, too, if you have my cell phone number. Nursing homes, right? We understand that nursing homes are a hotbed issue right now. We saw on the West Coast in Washington and some other states where that was, uh, and we've had that issue here in DuPage County already. If you have nursing homes in your still districts, please reach out to those administrators, either as the fire chief or the local emergency management officer to make sure that they have everything that they need and that they're following CDC protocols. If they don't, reach out through your emergency manager, through Mavis, through the state jock, through IEMA, to get them what they need. If we have to provide training to them and keep them abreast of what's going on, share these websites with them as well so that we can try to, to, to get a handle on this. We're not gonna see any information as to how well we're doing probably for about 14 or 13 days. Uh, in this issue, right? So as we start to flatten the curve, we're 14 or 15 days out from seeing if it's actually working, the social distancing. So we really need people to obey that and we need you to work with each other. Anticipate your needs and what you're gonna do in your local community to get things done. Again, just to review that reference guide that you're gonna have every day and hand out to your troops when they pull out the door. Um, the International Association of Firefighters, the International Association of Fire Chiefs, have documents out there, they have flowcharts out there for us to look at. 
What I would recommend is get them all, print them out, put them on a piece of piece of or put them on a table, and look at them and use the ones that are most safest. Put them all together and make one short one, so you have this for the protection of our members when they go out on the street. Chiefs, battalion chiefs, shift commanders, company officers, you have to reinsure your medics and firefighters that this is going to be okay. We're going to get through it. This is our job. This is what they hired us to do. They didn't hire us to go out and get sick. They didn't hire us to go out and get killed, but they hired us to help people. That is what we do. If we are protected and we are educated, we are going to do our job better. End of story. All right, so I just got one question from Hurls Rock. I wanted to try to answer that the best that I could. So I would try to create a policy locally with your emergency managers like we talked about earlier. We may have to shelter our responders in place at a motel away from their family if they're exposed or contaminated or if they have high-risk citizens or family members in their house. So that's something you can start working on now. We're not trying to dictate policy for your local organization. We're trying to give you avenues to try to create answers. So that would be something, Hurls Rock, that you should create on your own with the support of your department or individually even, right? So we need to anticipate our needs both as individual responders and both as responders to the community as a whole. Bobby, would you come back in? I got another question here. Sure. Before you read that question, one thing about getting in, in touch with your OEC, your police, and your dispatch and the hospitals, having a meeting, whether it's Skype, teleconference, whatever it is, you're going to find out what the current trends are in the hospitals. You need to know that. Are these are the hospitals filled up? Are they not taking any more patients? Is the emergency room open closed? Are they in bypass? These are things that these meetings are going to bring out. They're going to bring out the trends so we know what's going on and we can tell our people they're pulling out the door. Here's what's happening today. It's ever changing. We need to keep people informed. So I got another question from Greg Ritchie. Greg Ritchie's asking about, do we spray our M95 masks with disinfectant spray? So Greg, if you go to the IDPH website right now, just Google IDPH, they will tell you exactly what to do and how to reuse those M95s. You can also go to the CDC website, COVID-19 response. It will give you information on how to use that. So I would also say to any private vendor or any locale, any hardware store in the state of Illinois that has N95 masks, if you haven't already donated them to your first responders or you haven't donated them to nursing homes or hospitals, go find them, get them, they need them. I have a son that's an ER nurse, another son that's a firefighter paramedic in another locality, and my wife is a nurse that's treating patients as we speak. So this is a big issue for everybody, and we want to try to support every form of government that's responding to this issue. So private entity jumping on board and helping us as we respond to this is huge. Bobby? Again, again, out there, there's, there's uh, COVID-19 quick reference guides. I have one in front of me from the department. Uh, it pretty much covers everything from en route to the call to getting to the hospital. Notifications that need to be made. Uh, these things are important. They need to be given to our, our people when they pull out the door. It can't be where they're playing catch up. It's gotta be ready roll call. It's gotta be re reinforced by the company officers and the chiefs. And it's gotta be put in a laminated card so you can wipe it off and keep it in the cab of all the vehicles, even the chief's vehicle. Chief officers, get out there, listen to the radio, watch your people, see what's going on. Sit down at the kitchen table and reassure them that things are going to get better. We need our people to be healthy so they can respond. Okay, so one other thing that Bobby and I want to make sure we discuss, and I'm going to have Bobby address it right now. First of all, thanks for the questions. Keep them coming, right? You guys are helping steer the ship here. We want to make sure that we cover everything that, that, that's available to you, and we make sure we get your questions answered. I'm going to have Bobby talk about the plan of the day. We're all routine-based firefighters, right? Whether you come in as a volunteer organization and you check your trucks for your ride-alongs at nighttime, or you're full-time employed as a paid professional, we need to stick to the routine. I'm going to have Bobby talk about that routine and how it relates to the COVID-19 response and all the other ones that you still have to answer on a daily basis. Bobby, would you please cover that for me? Again, where does it start for the, for the fire service? It starts at roll call. So we need to reassure our people at roll call, the events of the day, what's going to happen. Obviously, this event is, is, takes precedent. We still have to go to fires. We still have to go to pin and accidents. We still pick up people that are sick. We need to cover all that stuff but we need to take the precautions that we need. Having it written down, bullet pointed on a sheet that all members can follow. And again, uh, this isn't, it is for the volunteers, but it's more so for shifts. And we've seen it in the fire service is we have three different shifts 
and sometimes we have three different ways of operating. We can't do that. We have to have the same SOGs. Where does that start? It starts at the chief level. The chief needs to meet with his companies. In smaller departments, if you don't have a, a chief officer that's a shift commander or a battalion chief, meet with the company officers, go to roll calls, take them in, talk to people about what you know, tell them, pass on the information on a daily basis. We need to live our lives in the fire stations like we had before. We gotta use extra precautions, hygiene, cleaning, everything. Uh, we, should, we should be doing that anyway, but we're gonna step it up a notch. Don't get complacent. Do not get complacent. Take, when, that, when that bell rings and that door goes up, take every run seriously. Cover yourselves, wear your PPE, and things will be a whole lot better. Educate your people. Hey, let's go ahead, Bobby. Let's no, get, let's, 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 so we're gonna talk about some of the other stuff that the IDPH sent us today. So we already covered reuse of N95 masks. We pretty much answered that. IDPH has that up on their website. You need to work with your EMS system. So there's many regions within the state of Illinois as it relates to paramedic response. And I'm still a paramedic 40 years in now. I just recertified. So I'm familiar with what Region 11 is doing. That's where my license is right now. But make sure that you reach out to your region and you can write new SMOs, new protocols, we're being told by IDPH, that relate to the way that you respond on a daily basis with this COVID-19 response. You work with your region director, your region director submits those protocols to IDPH and they're fast tracking decisions on those so that you're available to respond. Some of those things that we're already talking about that are being done in, in different localities, one person may go in dressed in PPE or nobody. If, if the civilian is able to come to the door and come outside so that you guys don't have to burn through your PPE, that's a great way to do that. There's also dispatch protocols on the CDC website on how to dispatch through this time and through these events. I would suspect that we're gonna be doing this for at least a month, maybe even longer. So that's why Bobby and I are hitting so hard on the preparation issue. You need to anticipate everything that we've talked about and then more. And if there's something that we haven't talked about already, Bob and I, please tell us what we should be talking about so we can get it to you. Bobby? Just to review, did you cover those yet, Tim? No, I have not covered those. Okay, important websites with information, and it's constantly changing and it's very good information. Yeah. You have the CDC. You have Illinois Department of Public Health, which just updated, they have it right now, as we speak, uh, effective today, they're gonna take a maximum of 250 first responders who are off duty, off duty. Uh, it's gonna be at 6959 Forest Preserve Drive, which is, I believe it's still in the city. Um, they're gonna take off duty first responders and healthcare workers and, and they're gonna be tested for COVID-19. 250 max, first come, first serve. I got some more on that, Bob. Okay. So uh, the federal government has also stood up three sites to test first responders, and I'm going to give you those addresses right now. Uh, if you don't hear them, we're going to post them on our website so that you have them after we're done talking. The Walgreens in Bolingbrook at 695 West Boughton Road. The Walmart in Joliet at 2424 West Jefferson Street. And the Walmart in North Lake at 137 West North Avenue in North Lake. These are testing sites for first responders. So if you feel that you need to be tested and it's okay through your chain of command, something that you probably need to let them notify of, don't be afraid to notify everybody up and down the chain of command. The chain of command needs to be very nimble right now. As Bobby said before, we need to support each other, right? Formal chain of command is out the window for the next 12 weeks. We need to support the firefighters and paramedics that are on the street doing their job every day, and we need to support the citizens. And to do that, we need to talk to each other, not send emails. Bob? Again, to go back over those websites because I wanted to get that address out there for the testing today. You've got the CDC, you've got the International Association of Fire Chiefs, you've got the International Association of Firefighters, we have our state AFFI and IDPH. Those sites have several, several items containing information that would be useful. It's constantly changing. What I recommend you do, not to get overwhelmed, take your department, have certain people plug into those websites, gather that information, sit down at the table, six feet apart and talk about what we can do as a plan to better our plan and again you have a written plan right now it's going to change because of the situation it's going to change we have to update it maybe several times a day maybe once a day it's according to what's coming out on the websites so again it's critical information we need to get it out 
All right, so I had another couple questions come in. Pat Harden from Mavis just told me that the, the site on Forest Preserve Drive is by appointment only. So you can reach out to Mavis at mavisillinois.org to get more information on that. And then I had somebody, uh, Larry Wasaki, asked me a question about spraying or putting another mask over the top of the N95 mask. Larry, I'm not sure about that. I would refer to the IDPH website as to how that's handled. I know that we're getting a lot of information from all over the place, but the two sites that I would go to to verify what's appropriate is the Illinois Department of Public Health and then the CDC website. Those are the two experts in that area as it relates to public health and PPE protection, so that's where I would go. Thanks for your questions, guys. Keep them coming. Also, one other thing, Bobby, before you come back in, Later on today, we're gonna to post all this information as a training video on the IFSI portal. So if you're not watching it live now, please share it with other companies that are on the street working right now. I'll follow up with questions that come in later. You can send us your questions right to the Illinois uh, IFSI Facebook page. I'll do minute messages as we go through the week with each speaker. And then the video I already told you about, let's talk about the lineup a little bit going through the week so you know where we're going. So on Wednesday, Richie Stack, who's a company officer in Chicago, who's working as we speak, is gonna talk about the company officer aspect. How company officers can work with EMS, who's taking a heavy toll on this, uh, law enforcement, and uh, the citizens. And then on Friday, Chris Downey's gonna come in. He's our program hazmat manager, or hazmat program manager. He's gonna talk about PPE, how to wear it, what's available, how to doff it uh, with the state standards, so that's available to you as well. And then on the following Monday, the 30th of March, Danny Ellis is gonna come in. He has a background in emergency management. He was the deputy director at OEMC in the city. He's gonna talk about collaborating with other agencies, how to stand up overview documents, how to get everybody on the same page so that you're all operating in concert together. And then on the following uh, Wednesday, assistant director Jimmy Moore is gonna be coming in. He's gonna talk about the mental aspects of dealing with this, both for you as an individual and your family and your loved ones so that we make sure that we get good resources out to you because we all stand together on, right, on this. This is not one person. This is the fire service and emergency medical service as a whole moving forward. And you guys are doing a great job. We wanna make sure that you have the information that you need. Bob? Yes, we're not, uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, what I'd like to cover again, and I know the majority of departments are doing this and we, we, we wanna reach out to the chief officers. If you need assistance, pick up the phone. Do not let this go. Do not stop bird dogging. If you're not getting answers, pick up the phone and call somebody that is. The most important people in the fire service are our firefighters and paramedics. We must take care of them. When the door goes up and the bell rings, we need to take care of them. That's our job. So again, if you need answers or questions answered, call, pick up the phone. Don't stop calling until you get an answer. There's answers out there. As a group, if we work together collaboratively, we will get the answers we need and we will have our people protected and safe. Hey, I just got another question from Adam. Adam, you said you can't find the link, so we'll post that when we get done today. But I would just, on our portal, the COVID-19 portal, on the IFSI website. Also, if you Google CDC COVID response, you're gonna get the, the big basic outline there for almost everything that we've talked about today. Not only dispatch protocols, responder protocols, safety in your home, there's tons of drop-down lists that it'd probably take you half a day to get through all the information. But it's a very good resource. So we'll make sure we get that to you, Adam. Again, since we started this broadcast, I've gotten five uh, notifications from IDPH on updates. So again, you probably leave that site open, most of these sites open because the information is constantly changing. So again, IDPH, all those uh, sites we gave you. So we're developing more training. Obviously, we need to be nimble as well. So this was the first five topics that we thought we should cover with you guys and girls out on the street. If there's something else that you need from us, we have 500 subject matter experts that work for the university in different areas, uh, and, and every area that you're working with right now, we'll find the correct person. I'll be here to moderate a little bit and assist the people for the next few days, but I'm not the guy. It's a we approach, not an I approach. And part of we is you on the street, mostly you on the street, so let us know what you need. Bobby, is there anything else that we, that we haven't covered here that we need to cover? I, I believe we hit all the, uh, the points. Again, we didn't get into uh, depth on all of them, but we did We did go over them. Let me just check, sorry guys, this is like a live classroom, so we're actually checking the board to make sure that we've covered everything that we want you to see. We don't want it to be too canned, and we don't want, we want you, like you're in the dirty classroom with us, 
So that's why we're turning our backs to the camera. I apologize. One, uh, one thing we didn't cover, we talked briefly on it, was families. Families of our first responders. It would be nice if chief officers, department heads, could have a fact sheet to send home with our first responders. To take the burden and the ease off, number one, if they have senior citizens living with them, their parents, grandparents, their children, their wives, their husbands, their significant others. We need to have a fact sheet out there. It'd be nice for us in the fire service to take that, write it down. It's not gonna have every answer on there, but it's gonna be, put people at rest a little bit when we give them information that they need to know. Okay, so I got one more question from Chief Grady at the State Fire Association, Fire Chief Association. Chief Grady, you're 100% right. We are in this together. Career, volunteer, local emergency managers, law enforcement, healthcare, local uh, park districts, restaurants. This is a we approach. Healthcare agencies. We all need to attack it that way. I want to thank Bobby Hoff for giving up 45 minutes and driving in this morning to make sure that we can get this done. Bobby will be with me the rest of the afternoon answering any questions that you guys might have uh, on this issue. And I will be back with Rich Stack on the 25th at 1130 to address the first responder issue on the street. Uh, and then we'll cover the, who's gonna speak on Friday. That's gonna, actually gonna be Chris Downey again. He's our HAZMAP program manager and he's gonna talk about PPE as it relates to this response. And we'll get more formal answers for you on reutilization of uh, the N95 mask for you guys then. Until that time, we look forward to seeing to you, and I'll follow up with impromptu minute messages as we go through the week to answer any questions that you have. Hey, keep fighting out there, and make sure that you know that the State Fire Academy supports you. Until then, we'll see you next time.